going back to the thing of the talk show, um, you were telling me the other day off air that actually you get asked very similar questions all the time, but lately in Romania, a woman asked you a question live on air that stumped you. Yeah. And, and she said, what do you think, Zan, is the role of women nowadays? Yeah, I was on a, uh, a woman's show in, in, on a Romanian radio show. She's been doing the show for many years. Lovely host. And, um, and I've been interviewed many times by women and men, but I've been interviewed by, I've talked to women's groups in various parts of the world. Only, I'm the only guy there in the whole conference. Um, and I've been asked a lot of questions by women. She asked me a question I've never been asked as an, in an interview. And she said this, in all your years of understanding and trying to learn the hearts and minds of women, what is the one thing that you still don't understand about women? Is there one thing you still don't understand? And I was, I've never been asked that. And I paused for a second. And my answer is, was the, the, the truthful one. And that is this, which is what we wrote about in here. The thing I still don't understand about women is what they want their role to be. <coughs> what do they want their role to be? That's, I don't know. And I'm not sure women know. I know. Well, it feels a bit risky saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Jordan. <laughs> well, I, well, I do and I don't, in a way. Um, I think men have got this same conversation as, as well. Like, in times gone by, it's been very simple to know, like, what is a man's role? Oh, uh, depends on our social class. But a lot has to right. do with... Um, Either the government's going to ship us out somewhere or we're going to have to uh, get a job as a doctor and a lawyer somewhere. A trade. Or we have a trade or yeah. we go to work in a factory or we go off to war somewhere. Like we, we grow up and we get allotted a position in society and then we just fulfill that position pretty much to the end of our lives unless we get promoted to inspector or prime minister or whatever it may be. And it's like the woman's role has been similar in that Going back to Pride and Prejudice, it's, um, oh, you marry the best right. guy you can for your allotted place in society. And now, the, I think there's a lot of cultural criticism that maps out the different stages of development of, of a culture, and a lot of it's quite predictable. And men and women, like, we are in traditional roles, you know, the, the breadwinner and the domesticated housewife, and we go into this corporate worldview and we go into this more like follow your heart yeah. worldview, let's become one with the earth again. And I think our role depends on just the level of culture that we're in at any given moment. It's, it's like we're, a lot of us think that we're actually asking independent questions of ourselves and really challenging the, the nature of culture and life, but we're all moving through this, these different waves of unfolding history. Yeah, we never had this before. We've always had like, um, relatively clean boxes to, to slot ourselves into. And now it's got so quick where actually you've got competing ideologies and, and things are moving over so fast. Like, met a woman very recently, her, her role was in the business world and then, like, that was 10 years and then the next day she, she wants to define something differently for herself. And, like, the old worldview has still got its, its claws in us it's hard to let it go and yeah. our grandmother has still got her claws in us and it's hard to get rid of that <laughs> and then the self-development book has got its claws in us as well and we want to follow the guidelines of that it's like many many layers of the onion wow. all competing for our attention and and it, like i say i know women's role but it's like mm. this new stage of man after the nice guy era is also asking these questions that's why it's time for that men's movement as well it's like well what are we really don't feel like i'm a competitive corporate guy definitely don't feel like a sensitive guy, new age guy that's yeah. got, got to do that thing. Yeah, it's the same question that we're asking ourselves, what's our role in this modern fragmented age, right? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? What's it going to develop into? Is it going to be completely like, you know, blended and disseminated and spread all over like, so the roles can be anything you want to be? This is our, you know, our whole, this whole generation is the, is the is over the last, I don't know how many years, has been this individualization. 
we never had before. We're always part of something. We've lost that. I mean, we know this. We've lost that essence of gathering, which, we, which always defined us. We had nature, this sense of tribe or the sense of belonging or the sense of joining a gang or doing it just so we can belong to something. And we're so individualized now. And we're, and, and we're instructed that that's the best way to be. Find your path. You know, uh, all these different things about being individual and not being in the collective somehow. And, and so we struggle. And so we flip flop. Woman goes into business for 10 years and I want something more spiritual or something. I want to, I want to go in a different direction. And so we're, yeah, so it's a I'm, confusion. I'm definitely starting to see glimpses on my travels of this post individualized age. And it's very, very small glimpses of it. And it's all up for design ourselves. That's basically all I know. <laughs> I think you're right. I've seen a change too in the last 12 years I've been doing this kind of work. And the questions are different. The question is, how do I get a, how do I get a phone number? How do I get a girl? But I, the questions are different. Something's shifting. I feel it too when I talk to crowds. I feel like, especially when I talk to young people. I talk to young people in, in, in an audience and they say, hey, we don't have these problems you're talking about. We resolve our, 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 we, our, we have a conversation. We inherited from you this generation of heavy debt uh, that we've got to fix, thanks, of, of your medication, your self-medication, that you guys are all woe is me, uh, th therapy, life coaching, uh, take pills, and we don't want anything to, do, anything to do with it. We can do it ourselves. Yes. Actually, you we're going to fix what you guys broke. If I'm very authentic with my brothers around me and the women in my lives, and that seems to be the value nowadays, if we're all very authentic with each other, we can do our own coaching, our own therapy, yeah. our own co-creations. Yeah, our whole thing is everybody's got to have this. Everybody became so individual that we all need therapy and, and medication just to get through it, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a theory by, I can't remember the names of the guys, but they wrote a book called The Fourth Turning. And I mentioned it to you before, I think. And it's, it talks about how every generation sh uh, rejects the, the primary values of the generation before. So after World War II, we had this can-do generation, we cannot fail. The world's been saved, and there was, a, there was an optimism in that, and they, they did all kinds of wonderful things. The generation after that said, well, the world's not all roses like you think, 50s, you know, like the Stepford Wives type of thing, and they rejected it, and, and, let, and everything, there was no, let everything go. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the hippie era kicked in. The generation after that said, wait a minute, we don't want to burn our bras and run around barefoot, we want stuff. So when did this 80s consumerism, you know, all that kind of stuff. Which is now feels like it's starting to get heavy and die. For sure. You, believe it or not, we're consumed out. We've had so many choices and that you, I feel it in the conversation with people that we're post-consumerism. You can feel it. And so the next thing, in other words, that consumer generation and that self-medicated generation, that self-help generation, the self-help industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Self-help, right? Help yourself. That part and parcel, I think, if their theory is correct, is going to be rejected by this next generation that's growing up. Say, no, no, no. We're born with cell phones in our hands. We're born with technology. We'll use technology. We will solve the problems. We don't need that self-medication and that uh, self-help from you guys anymore. Or we're, we're not going to be like that. We're going to be the, the concept of this, of this book, I believe, is that it's going to be another can-do generation behind this, this woe is me, life sucks generation. Imagine that. The next generation of young people come and say, hey, we're going to solve this. And we're going to... It's a generalized theory, of course, but it's an interesting theory. So we're going deep into our <laughs> cultural theories. <laughs> which I think is a future chapter as well. Should we head That's back true. to women? Yes. Great. Next thing. Um, going back to this idea of below all the different uh, voices and roles of our times that in the heart of a man is this yearning for adventure or what's beyond. In the heart of a woman is this desire for a love story. 
Oh, say that again. Just be careful here with their words. Yeah. The desire for man is? The desire for man is this yearning for an adventure, something beyond the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the yearning of a woman is for the love story. Yeah, because the yearning of both man and woman is for the adventure, for the horizon. I think I said it in there. The difference is that men singularly point their noses toward that horizon. Unless they're distracted or, or mediocre or whatever, but in, but but men that are that are seeking something look at it. They focus toward it. And women that are seeking something, they focus toward it too, but they want to do it in conjunction of relationship. We do too. We just don't express it. There was a study, and I, I can't remember um, where it's from, and I, I've said it before, I, don't, I didn't write it in there, but um, where they took uh, mothers and toddlers. So they took, a, they took a set of mothers and their little girls who were just, you know, just two years old or so. And they did, and they did this uh, experiment where they put the, a mother in, the, in a room with her little girl, her little toddler, and there's a bunch of toys in the room. And in the center of the room was a low table with a toy cow on the center of the table. And they said to, they said to the mothers, the only instruction you have, and they had cameras and everything, the only instruction you have is, your little girl can play with any toy in the room, but she can't play with that toy cow. Just make sure she knows that that's a forbidden cow, toy. So the mother goes in there and she says, okay, little sweetie, listen, you can play with the dolls over here and this little, these little toys over here, but you can't play with this cow. You can't touch the cow. And for the rest of the time then, the girl's like holding a doll, playing with dolls like this, and she's looking at the cow, which is of course now the object of desire. But every time she'd look at the cow and she'd like kind of lean toward it, she would glance up at her mother's face and her mother would just have to raise an eyebrow or just do that and the little girl would turn away and play with her dolls again, right? And that was, that was a universal across cultures. Then they did the same experiment with, with the mothers and a little boy, a little toddler boy. Same instruction, sweetie, you can play with every, the toys and trucks and cars and stuff over there, and, but you can't touch this cow, you're not allowed to touch a cow. And the little boys, the moment they said, okay, let's go ahead and start playing, they headed straight for the cow. Ah! And the mother had to restrain them. Say, no, 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 play with this. Because ah, ah, it was the object of desire too. But the boys were heading straight for the cow and never once did they look at their mother's face. They didn't check in. They didn't check in. They just only saw the cow and wanted it. So the object of desire is the same. Adventure horizons, treasure. We all want the same beautiful, glorious thing. But women check in. And men do not. Men just say, I want this object. And that's that, that experiment with the children describes, I think, the difference between men and women right there. Women want the same glorious things. They're just as driven as we are. But they want it in the context of relationships that, that mother's face is approving. That friends, that, that there's, an, there's, there's, there's a, a collaboration spirit. And men don't notice that. This is why women have so much more experience when it comes to the dating world and when it comes to uh, reading emotions because they've been, they've been looking at faces their whole lives and we have not. So this is not to diminish that women's, women's only goal is to be a housewife. And women want great things too and, and great, large, ambitious things. And they want to be, you know, massive projects and various things too. Uh, but they want, but women... In general, because I'm so generalizing, <laughs> I want to do it in the context of relationships. Men do too, but they want the relationship to happen around them while they head for the goal. Interesting. So you still need to be checking in with your girl, even though you're heading for the horizon. <laughs> it's kind of... Yeah, the lesson is that in general, men are driven by the goal and see nothing else. Yeah. Women are driven by the goal but see everybody around them and want everyone to be. And the, the, it's like when I, I wrote in the book here, little boys play King of the Hill. We played that in Canada. I don't know if you guys played that. What is that? Yeah. King of the Hill? Oh, you never heard this? It's like you got a little mound of a, of a hill and little boys say, okay, let's play King of the Hill. And they fight and wrestle to see who's on the top and they throw the other kids off. Like they're just pushing each other and laughing and joking and pulling each other down to see who can stand on the top. And they're all jostling for position, King of the Hill. 
Yeah. It's only a Canadian thing. Oh, done too. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just like little boys playing with a little yeah. hill. I'm the king of the hill. I'm the king of the hill. No, you're not. And they, and they wrestle and push each other off. And it's fun. The girls want to play king of the hill too, but they say, okay, you go first, and then it'll be Sally's turn, and then... And then, okay, she's, you were king of the hill twice already, so let her be. Mm. So that's why girls were boring at school. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I wrote that. Nobody knows what king of the hill is. Hmm. Mm. I thought you Brits would know. Because. We, well, have, we have kings? No, because we, inher- <laughs> we inherited all your games. Yeah. British Bulldog we played in school. Oh, wow. um, all those things. We've, yeah. And you're, yeah. It's one thing I noticed when you come back from the playground, when I was in school anyway, you always had scars on you. <laughs> You didn't mm. know teachers went, oh, did you play with the other kids? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a broken ankle. You didn't play very well. <laughs> so one thing I learned is I'm going to stop trying to do these convenient recaps of an earlier point just in case it's too generalized. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, we're generalizing a lot here. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, you say, on the subject of every woman wanting to be in a love story, uh, to be noticed, adored, desired, this is a vital element to the heart of a woman, as necessary as air and water. She can't live without it. Nothing will ever supplant or replace that. The man who understands this understands everything. The man who understands this is forever surrounded by beauty. Mm-hmm. And in the next little bit, you go into a florid description of, it was a time not so long ago when she was a girl skipping happily through the fields of her childhood. She danced and sang on those lazy forever days, etc. Um, Earlier on, when you talk about Camus and Sartre and how they would uh, meet a woman and explain her soul to her, yeah. I imagine that you could do something like this. What do you mean in that? To, to talk about those days? Talk about those... Maybe not in those days, but we talked a while ago about the idea of walls or seduction and objections and the... She's obviously interested, but yeah. has defenses and opinions that, that stand in her way or stand in both of your way. I imagine that you would, you again, come back and again and again to, the, to what you believe is the truth, yeah. that underneath it all, she wants to go back to those days. Yes, and I've had women say to me, I never had, I never had a dream like that. It wasn't my dream. So I'm, like, this is a very generalized statement. And, um, but it's more the feeling of what the innocence of our childhood and what we dreamed about when we were children, boys too. And that gets slapped out of us so fast with society and school and, you know, and obligations and bills and, you know. And so the whole point of this passage is that there's a representation of, of refreshing escape from all that, which is not, doesn't mean that you're, um, physically running away into the field and giving it all up and responsibilities or whatever. I don't mean that. But it's more like this, again, the spirit of what we're trying to talk about here. A man that comes into her life like this represents something that she used to, to dream about mm. when, she was, when she was young, when she used to believe in life on that side of it, you know? And it's a representation because he represents that spirit of adventure and fun and possibilities where other men are just trying to score or whatever. I've definitely come across women that I believe that strongly and have wanted to express that and wanted her to have seen that in herself and she's been like, no. Well, yeah. It's not true for me. And I'm not saying that this is a, a this is an ideal or something to strive for. And if women don't feel this, then they're not fully experiencing the experience of a woman. I don't mean that at all. I'm just talking in, in stories. I'm just talking in generalized stories of how it seems to me. And and I'm not trying to evade it or say, hey, no, I didn't mean that. I'm, I do mean it. I mean what I say there. And I do believe it rings true. It seems to, be, seems to me that this rings true to me. And there will be all kinds of women say, well, I, I can't identify with that. That I understand. And if it's not an absolute, it's certainly a fine illusion. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sounded nice to me. <laughs> yeah. 
feel a bit frustrated actually. It's like I want it to be completely true all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> With every moment. Um, yeah, sure. sure. I mean yeah. I mean what a story to yeah. what a story to go through life believing everything can be I don't know, roses and unicorns. Like choose your life to, to choose to live your life on the bright side. There's a lot of pragmatic people, a lot of people with a very practical bent. And they say, well, or a very scientific bent. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm appealing to the artist side of things. Because I see things in the artist's way, I guess you could say. And that's, that's why I could, have, I could have written this book in a very clean-cut academic way. Mm. No problem. That would be an interesting thing to do. To go back through and strip all the language out of it and just say mm. stay, stay the statements. Mm. Wow. That'd be like a page and a half. That's <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, true. <laughs> a practical editor could come to chop it down. Because <laughs> I'm curious about it too. As I said, this is a fabric. This is a tapestry. Of, this is a painting. This is a, this is a, a sensibility that, I'm trying to, that I tried to capture from what women have told me in their wistful moments. When women sitting there and their eyes are, 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 are teared up. And I've been in that space many, many, many times. And I've said it in there and I said it strong. That women of power have said to me, this didn't come from me. This chapter did not come from my, from my, uh, my study about women like, a, like someone studies chimpanzees. Mm-hmm. Oh, the small one is, is like aggressive to the big one. And I'm making an observation about that. This has, been a, this has been a dialogue with women. And where these powerful women who are CEOs and bankers and, and uh, powerful women have said, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm living in this man's world. I'm creating ex- experiences in this man's world. And I would give it all up for romance. But think of it, we would too. Why are we, what's our endeavor for anything? What are we trying to do when we're trying to create a business? Trying to live a life that has, has a flow to it and, and, and ease of breathing, fun, I, I did this legacy and I can, and I can, and I can, and I have a, an energetic aliveness because of it, as opposed to, I'm going to be like the work, 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 work. Nobody wants to work 60 hours a week with no fulfillment, right? I'm building this multi-billion dollar corporation, but I hate my life. I'm talking, I have a friend who's one of the senior, or not one of the senior, but he's very high placed in a technology company, makes obscene amounts of money, been there for a long time, stock option, all thing. And he said, I have no passion. I have this beautiful house. And I sit here in my sweatpants when I'm not at work. I just look out the window. I have nothing, no passion in my life at all so so men would give it all up too for a life of adventure and romance if they weren't afraid women will too it's like we're in love with the idea of falling in love to use a trite saying yeah exactly and women have certainly told me this Any more questions? Yeah. Jordan's got a lot. Yeah. I took the wind out of my sails a little bit. What are you thinking? Actually. Nothing, actually. There's no like, thought or anything. It's just like, oh, I had a few questions, but. Yeah. I mean, I'm, sp- I'm saying strong, broad statements. Yeah. So. I've got a question here about inspiration and magic, and, the, and that's what women bring in. This guy in the book, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. This guy. That guy. <laughs> so, the inspiration and magic, it comes from uh, uh, the way you look at the world. Uh, I, I imagine from her. She, she brings him inspiration and magic? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Sure. I'm convinced of this, guys. We can be strong, vibrant, alive men because of women. Can't do it in a vacuum. 
we have magic in our soul and a spring in our step because of, of, of what that half of the population brings to us. That's my belief. I do believe that. We can't be, that's why we can't do anything like, for instance, a men's movement we talked about in an earlier episode. We can't have a men's movement if we don't have, if it's not inspired and uh, by the female spirit. It's not going to happen. Or it's not going to be a, a, a holistic one or a great one, an antagonistic one. We talked about this a little earlier, but I mean, from my engineering background, it's, it, it makes sense. We talk about all the big projects in the world were, were done as a, a romantic thing and yeah. inspiration of women and all the beauty in the buildings and, and bridges all over the world and, and everything is uh, in, inspired by women. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Rockefeller said, if it wasn't for women, money would have no, no purpose. Yeah. That's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I do anything reason for is because I like women. Changing tone on the subject of women. Um, you've got another one of these stories here where you're, uh, it's like you've got uh, an artistic type scenario and your girlfriend's in a room and men are coming in one by one. Oh yeah, that was a, that's a, yeah. <laughs> we'll lay down in the book. Yeah. Um, and there's one chapter that, like, the, there's, a, there's a sentence here that really catches my eye and, and it's reminiscent of something you say a lot. So this whole book is about beauty and the, the like, just your, your love for women that's propelled so many years of exploration and yet there's a phrase here, a phrase here you're saying, you stand there before me in innocence, yet underneath that raffiné elegance is a dirty, dirty girl, a trollop, a siren, a possession, a tramp, your body not perfect, but fully embraced. <laughs> so there are some strong, dirty words there. Oh, yeah. Trollop, mm -hmm. tramp. Dirty, yeah. dirty girl. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it felt. It's perfectly aligned with everything else I'm saying. Because women feel that. They want to feel that. In my experience, women want to feel for that one guy. I wrote in there. Every woman has a little bit of a horror in her for that one guy. Not for you and you and you. Don't be disrespectful. But for her man in the bedroom, she wants to feel the trollop. She wants to feel that energy. She wants to like, yeah, I'm bad too. The most elegant, refined girl, the most elegant, refined woman is dirty. It's the way it is. And I know this. And it's, not, it's women telling me this. Women are thinking about sex more than men. Constantly. But they, 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 they hide it. They, because of social graces and judgment and morals and, and all kinds of you know, religious upbringing, whatever it is, they are masters at completely masking it. When, it, when they're hormonal, when they're, when, they're, um, when they're ovulating, something kicks in and that kind of arrives, that surges through her body, where she's extremely feeling sexy. But you'd never know it. You'd better tell the difference between that and her like two weeks later. Because they, because they hide it. So yeah, every woman wants to feel that. I've been taught, told this by women over and over and over again. We are innocent. We are kind. We are mothers. We are caregivers. We are gardeners. We are all those great things. But at the same time, we want to be seen. We want to be desired. We want to be, we want to be, uh, we want our husbands to lust after us. Not every man, but we want to be, for that man, we want to be, we want to be that dirty girl for him. We want to be that, we want to be his whore. Right? Spoken the way of men about men have a higher and lower energy. Do you think there's an equivalent for women? Hey, that's a good question. 
Hey, yeah. I think that's a good, maybe a good way of saying is it. Is that the Madonna Hall complex? Yeah, because the there's, higher a, level? there's a higher energy, which is would be the equivalent of... I've never thought of that before. I've been saying this so long about men. Yeah. I mean, I talk in this chapter about the, the two ribbons. Hmm. My metaphorical image of two ribbons in a woman's life. I don't need to go into it here. But one ribbon that she holds onto with her left hand is the ribbon of, of straight truth, sensibility, sensible shoes, her hair in a bun, um, career, motherhood, all these great, beautiful things that she wants for her future. That's a great, you know, that's all these wonderful things. And then the other side is another ribbon, which is a sinuous, kind of like, a sensuous, seductive r ribbon that she also wants to hold on to her whole life, which is her being bent over, her letting her hair down, her being caught up on a horse, her being, her being uh, uh, wistful and staring out the window and, and you know, feeling the sand with her toes. That girl too. Mm. And they want both. But they usually get one or the other. You usually get a guy who's sensible, good father, good provider, a uh, companion, likes the same movies as her, you know, and that's a great, comfortable, strong feeling. But there's no sense of animal attraction. You said it, like the magnetism. There's no sense that he's going to come home from work and kick open the door. Where's my woman? Where is she? There she is. I want this. Move the table aside and, let, and go and bend her over. Spank her a bit. No sense of that. Or she, gets a, or she gets a man who represents this other ribbon, which is all only that. Passion, romance, but he's not going to stay. He's got no commitment in his, in his soul. He's got he's to he's run along. And he's very much a lover. And she's caught up in that. But she needs this stability and kind of sense of shared purpose too. And the plight of women is how to get a man that is both ribbons, that represents both ribbons, right? Which is what we're talking about here. She gets one or the other. So yeah, women, everything is, everything is like, uh, it's interesting because it, as I wrote this book, everything I tried to say, okay, there's three stages of this, three stages of that, three stages of this, you know? But when I'm talking about uh, the, the psyche of man and woman, there always seems to be a, 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 two, a duality, a diptych instead of a triptych. The curious thing about the ribbons is where you say a woman who finds she only has one of these ribbons will always reach out for the other yeah. one. So a woman in a, in a steady, comfortable relationship will always reach out for a sense of passion. That's controversial, but it's been my experience, yeah. Now, she, when I say always, uh, she may be constrained by, uh, like I said, morality and um, or social whatever. I'm not saying that it's inevitable, but I'm saying that that yearning is there so strong that, and it's such a necessary thing for a woman's, for a woman's sense of aliveness, fulfillment, that she can't be, is this true? Yeah, she can't be blamed. She's blameless if she has to reach out for that, in my eyes. Maybe not to society, the world, but I understand it. So again, it sounds like you're speaking of a spirit of things, which is a woman might be in a committed relationship and rather than actually cheat on her husband, there might be flirtatious moments that actually feel like a little bit of a betrayal of that intimacy or a late night phone call right. with a man who represents the lover archetype in right. her life. Because she needs it. Yeah. She's not getting it. Right? She needs it. And the other way around, the sense of Oh, the woman who has, you know, a lover, this bad boy jerk type lover, um, or a succession of this kind of lovers, always wants to have a guy or two in the yeah. friend zone because, ah, oh, here's my stability that's going along and she'll reach out and pull that ribbon and pull someone into that friend zone yeah. to give her a bit of stability while this lover thing is that's all tumultuous. Tumultuous, yeah. And she'll never be with that companion because she's wrapped up in this ribbon. Yeah. But she reaches out for it as well. She needs it. She needs to hang on to something stable. Something like, that's for sure. Like the parable. Like the parable. Yeah. Now, of course, I'm making blanket statements again. And I'm talking about the heart of women. And I'm a guy. <laughs> mm. But it rings true to me. 
and this is what women have, have taught me. And I'm just translating what I've, what I've felt and heard and seen. Maybe it's why we have these phenomena at the moment, like the book Fifty Shades of Grey. I've never read it, but I've heard it's the general consensus of a pretty badly written book by most standards. Yet it's phenomenal because that's obviously missing from the heart of women. Yeah. That masculine energy. And even though the book is a pale portrayal of what that's like in real life. Yeah. And you're just reading, it's a passive, it's a vicarious experience. If women haven't found that in the men, they'll find it in a book. <laughs> how, how many book clubs are there around the world where they read romance novels? The number one type of book in the world is romance novels. There's a reason for that. Women are not being swept up into something. They've got mundane relationships, mundane lives. Beige lovemaking, as they called it. It's good enough. Man, that's good. Hey, and what do you expect from me? I'm trying to be the breadwinner and trying to, you know. Yeah, there's a whole plight of women in there that I've seen. And and I and this is this will go against all convention. I understand why women have affairs. And I understand why men have affairs. And shockingly, I think in a general sense, women do too. Women get it. I wrote that in there. And I'll have all kinds of groups going after me and saying, hey, no, how, how, can you, how dare you say that? But it seems to me that that is, that is accurate and, and, and there's a truth to that, for sure. 